and uh, you know at, the, at New York Law School talking mm-hmm. about the the issues and that. Uh, Felipe is he? He's from England, I guess. The fellow was on uh, the panel. Philippe Sands. Sands, yeah. He is, and mm-hmm. he's a professor in, I believe, Oxford. I think there's probably going to be a lot of uh, things coming from the law schools, don't you think? And universities in general about the current situation, more symposia and so forth. I wonder. There'll be a talk. How much influence it will have? I well, don't know. that's another issue. <laughs> welcome, welcome very much to conversations. It's a pleasure to welcome um, to the program um, St- Stephen Holmes. He's a professor of law. He's also got a center that's just getting started there, the, the Center for Law and Security, that we'll want to talk about. He's also concerned with international law, and uh, Stephen, welcome really very much to Conversations Manhattan. Thank you for Network. having me. My pleasure. We, we were just chatting when we started that I had met you at a, a symposium they had or a, a panel discussion about the current situation, uh, international law in Iraq and so forth at the New York University School of Law. And uh, I was wondering if there isn't going to be more discussion of that, and we'll want to talk about that in this, in this program. But I wonder if you could, for the audience, could you share a little of just thumbnail or uh, background on yourself, where you come from, that sort of thing, and then we can you get mean, in. I grew up in St. Louis, grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, and mm-hmm. uh, went to school in the Middle West, uh, undergraduate school at Denison University in Granville, Ohio. Then I went to grad school at Yale, mm-hmm. uh, and I have my PhD from Yale. I had a uh, teaching career at various places. I taught at Harvard for six years and the University of Chicago Law School for dozen years. Then mm-hmm. I moved to Princeton. I finally, just now, five years ago or so, moved to N- NYU School of Law, uh-huh. where I am now. Yeah, well, that's a pretty good uh, background. You're at some important school. And were you in law all the while? That you were I know. I started in the law school, uh, really, at the University of Chicago. That's where I uh, moved over to the law school. because, And you can see uh, there are so many issues in uh, law that are raised today, which is what you were, mm-hmm. uh, what you were witnessing the other night. Yeah. Partly because of our world situation yeah. today, mm-hmm. where the American government seems to be uh, committed, at least some members of the administration, committed to the idea that law is, in many cases, a hindrance mm-hmm. to its ability to react appropriately to danger. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there is some kind of hostility. You must have picked this up in the uh, symposium the other night, because yeah. we had a group of international lawyers mm-hmm. who were... I wouldn't say defensive, but we're certainly uh, trying to defend a system of international law, including the United Nations system, Mm -hmm. against what they interpreted as an administration's impatience Mm -hmm. with legal regulation. Uh So that, I think, is a great topic, uh, which I hope we can get into here and talk about. I think it would be good to, if we could, particularly for the lay population, and myself and the lay population who don't understand well, because rule of law is a big idea, isn't it? That we have a society that can have uh, something other than just brute uh, social Darwinistic uh, uh, power relationships among the members of it. Rule of law is a very big and important idea. I don't know, maybe it would be worthwhile. When we think in terms of um, history of law, we can go back to Hammurabi, I guess, and that sort of thing, or the, the things could, yeah. that, 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 that evolved, the evolving of law, and that's always being evolved within a broader social, economic, political context, the evolution of human society. But the rule of law is a really important concept uh, to uh, deal with philosophically and in practical terms. You know? It's often more of a slogan than mm-hmm. an idea, okay. and people use the phrase mm-hmm. a lot without really being able to think it through and, for example, understanding its relation to things like, um, oh, special interest legislation, yeah. which we know. We know that every legal system that has appeared on the face of the earth mm-hmm. has is shot through with favoritism mm-hmm. toward well-organized groups and so forth. So the category rule of law is complicated, and it could be discussed. Of course, we could have a whole program just talking about that. Yeah. But I think on the what I would like to uh, take us to, if I yeah, could, particularly sure. because of the Iraq mm-hmm. war and yeah. uh, the issues that it has raised, <coughs> is the relevance of international law to America's role in the world and the security interests, the national security interests of the United States. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and if I could just tell you the way I'm thinking about this, do, and then yeah. we can, uh, mm-hmm. or you can see what questions you want to ask or mm-hmm. what what do you want to follow up on. Mm-hmm. The experience of 9-11 was filtered 
uh, for the administration, I believe, through an interpretive framework that had at its base a concept of security threats. And the two principal security threats which the policymakers who are in control today saw behind 9 11, not exactly exemplified in 9 11, but behind, or not completely, were a proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. And there were no weapons of mass destruction used. But there was a uh, a wake, it was viewed as a wake-up call. 9-11 was viewed as a wake-up call signaling that weapons of mass destruction could be smuggled into the country by non-state actors, terrorist groups, who could use the drug smuggling channels that we know we can't control mm -hmm. and bring into our major urban centers, which are not protected, uh, perhaps a, a, a nuclear weapon or a biological chemical weapon that could wreak ma mass casualties and could even make urban life in one of our great urban centers impossible. So there was a panic. Uh, the, the interpretive frame in which 9-11 was uh, received or, or, or understood mm -hmm. included terrorism and weapons of mass destruction. Now the problem with terrorism and weapons of mass destruction as two threats is that neither of them uh, can be eliminated forever. Once they emerge, they have to be lived with, they have to be managed, they, have, they can be dampened down, they can be perhaps uh, uh, made less dangerous, but you can't uh, eliminate proliferation. Once science has invented these weapons, the capacity to create them is in the heads of, for example, escaping Iraqi scientists who may be living anywhere in the world now under pseudonyms. You, it's very difficult uh, to eliminate, but the methods we have of dealing with both proliferation and terrorism are multilateral, that is, they are mostly legal. For example, the international arrest warrant is a multilateral institution. Even people who don't like the UN and who say, and I believe correctly, that the world cannot be ruled through the UN, which would not work, nevertheless, we depend for our own security on international arrest warrants and on the cooperation of police around the world, including the French police, who, by the way, have an excellent group of anti Islamic terrorist agents who know Arabic very well and have tremendous capacity to penetrate into the Islamic uh, fundamentalist cells that are living among the uh, uh, Muslim populations of Europe. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, we are... Growing number of people. Growing number of people, but the degree to which the United States is dependent upon the voluntary cooperation of the French and German police has been understated by this administration, which claims that we can do everything by ourselves. And of course, there is no way we can do things by ourselves. This, the policing response to international terrorism, is not, uh, 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 there is no option. We, have, we do not have the option of doing this by ourselves. I wonder if I could interject here one sure. thing in terms of this, uh, back philosophically and so forth to the law and so forth. We, we, we live, uh, let's say, in the United States of America, we live in a uh, polity of 50 different states. We ha each of those have municipalities, and they have municipal courts, they have jurisdiction, they have state jurisdiction. We have federal courts, federal jurisdiction. I remember Mr. Wallace used to object to some of the four federal uh, marshals coming into his area. We had a thing called states' rights. It was very important to many of the segregationists in the South when sure. civil rights was being pushed. So that was being uh, put upon them. And then these national sovereignties that uh, usually get together, in our case, you know, uh, federal, the Constitution of the United States, we are a sovereign entity, and we have, what, 191 countries around the world that are sovereign entities, and then they are asked to interrelate through these institutions of international law, which are emerging. Um, I remember Hans Morgenthau and uh, the other writers, and even Haushofer and the people of Realpolitik, saying that we live in a world where the law, the sovereignty is at the national level, and international law uh, that the, they would say moral nation. That is, you have a, a series of laws and understandings and so forth at a, na at a national sovereign level, uh, but in international law, it's um, moral nation, immoral world, that there are no binding principles in international well, that's law. To, that is and the basis of realpolitik has been part of the thinking that differentiated many of the international thinkers from those who... Uh, a thought in terms of domestic terms. But you have a series of hierarchical systems of law and jurisdictions that overlap. Um, and I, I wonder, if that did that come into play, particularly as the world continues to globalize, more and more institutions have created international protocols, the evolving of a, a body of international law that has teeth and real meaning in the same way that sovereign 
laws within right. a nation do? Well, a couple points in response to that. One, domestically, the fact that we have so many jurisdictions mm -hmm. within the United States mm -hmm. is itself a problem for security. Mm -hmm. If you remember the Washington sniper, mm -hmm. was halfway through his sniper rampage before anyone realized that he was a serial sniper because the local jurisdictions, the local police, were not sharing information with each other mm -hmm. across jurisdictions. So, Interesting. in mm -hmm. fact, federalism, decentralization, while you may believe in decentralization as a f greatest form of liberty, one of the consequences of it is that criminals, and even madmen, can get away with murder mm -hmm. because police are not able to cooperate. Mm -hmm. And if you believe that the highest value of our Constitution is separating power that is governmental power, yeah. and not allowing it to cooperate, mm -hmm. you are then handing over the lives of our shoppers at the shopping malls to whatever sniper happens to have a car fast enough to cross a jurisdictional line. So I think this is a big issue about uh, police data sharing mm -hmm. uh, across jurisdictions as a form of security, uh, 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 security enhancement. And I think inevitably, as uh, national security concerns become more pressing uh, in the United States, these forms of states' rights, state autonomy uh, 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 claims will be less, uh, will, will seem less plausible to the public. Mm -hmm. Now, about international law on this issue, I gave you an example of the international arrest warrant. Mm -hmm. The international arrest mm -hmm. warrant, which has a certain form and so forth, does exist, and that shows that internationally we do not have an anarchy. It isn't a, a space that is not regulated. Mm -hmm. We have all kinds of, interna uh, 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 of international treaties that govern environmental concerns and so forth. The co commercial law, of course, is international, international trade law. Yeah. But I think most important for the issues that I was discussing yeah. are non-proliferation treaties. Because it may be possible, as some members of the administration seem to believe, uh, to scare people into not developing weapons of mass destruction, frighten them. But the traditional way of preventing proliferation of we weapons of mass destruction, destru uh, destruction are treaties. Mm -hmm. Why does every country in Europe not have nuclear weapons? They're rich enough. The answer is they were inside a treaty-based security system that made them felt, feel safe. Mm -hmm. The way you prevent weapons of mass destruction from proliferating is to prevent people from feeling unsafe by giving them a structure which protects them. That's true in the Middle East as well. The Iraqis, to speak of a uh, current topic, yes. had a neighbor called mm -hmm. Iran mm -hmm. that has obviously or plausibly could be believed to have uh, aggressive weapons of mass destruction programs. It is implausible to ask the Iraqis to assume that they wouldn't try to develop their own in that context. So you can't just scare the, you couldn't before the recent events simply scare them into putting away their weapons as long as the Iranians were still there developing their programs. So you have to develop a regional security system. This requires international legal arrangements of mm -hmm. some kind. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's why you can't ask for unilateral disarmament. Disarmament doesn't occur by your at, you're forcing one party to put down his weapons. You have to get everyone in the region to put down their arms at the same time. Mm -hmm. That's a treaty. Mm -hmm. That's a non-proliferation mm -hmm. disarmament uh, treaty system. So mm -hmm. the United States must work through international law if its problems, two basic problems, are terrorism and weapons of mass destruction. Treaties are very, very sacrosanct, aren't they? They're very high level of well, uh, some order are in terms and of... Well, some are and some have can be ignored. And uh, uh, this is, I don't I don't want to take an idealistic or Pollyannish view of international law, mm -hmm. particularly the United Nations, uh, uh, because of its experience during the 90s or its non-successful or scandalously um, uh, disreputable behavior in the 1990s, particularly in the case of Rwanda, mm -hmm. uh, where the United Nations uh, was capable of probably, in the United Nations framework, it was possible to prevent the genocide in Rwanda, and uh, that didn't happen. The United States bears its own share of the burden for uh, blame for that. It's also true that Kosovo, which many liberal uh, uh, humanitarian interventionists uh, supported the cam campaign in Kosovo, occurred outside the UN framework. Mm -hmm. Because after all, what is the UN? Mm -hmm. That is, what is the Security Council? The Security mm -hmm. Council is five countries, mm -hmm. China, 
Mm -hmm. Russia, one country you, who keeps quiet, China. One country you can buy off, Russia. Uh, one country whose ego you need to stroke, France, and so forth. So mm. this is not a, more, a body who has, a, uh, that is this Security Council, that has enormous moral prestige. It's mm. just some countries. But it reflects, re in a certain sense, the founding of the United Nations is a great hope to save us the scourge of war, was also reflect, wanted not to be, as you put it, Pollyannishly uh, idealistic or something of the way we might like sure. things to be. It wanted to reflect the power differentiations that is reality and forms the basis of uh, a good deal of realpolitik sure. as it's been evolving. Sure. You know? And that, that was true in 1945 mm -hmm. or 40, in the late 40s. Mm -hmm. France, well, France is a question, but France, Britain, Russia, China, the United States mm -hmm. were the great powers. And you couldn't do anything successful in the world if you didn't have, for example, Russian approval. Today, Russia is a basket case. Mm -hmm. uh, it has an economy smaller than Holland. Mm -hmm. It is not a it's a superpower only in the sense that it has a horrible residual arsenal of weapons of mass destruction that it might spill in, uh, purposely or inadvertently onto the clandestine international arms market. Mm -hmm. So it is not a superpower. Why is it there? It's there because of historical happenstance. Mm -hmm. We have to deal with it, but that means that the Security Council no longer reflects, as you say, mm -hmm. it did earlier on, well, we the have real... So, uh, sorry, yeah, we, well, we have a different kind of world now. The French say that there, we have uh, one uh, hyperpower. They call the United States of America is a, a superpower, an imperium that uh, reaches around the world. So we don't have a dialectic as we did with the, with the Soviet but none, Union. Yeah, that's and, true. And so we have, it's really here, so we, we, we are in a class by ourselves and in all of history. But no power strength and weakness is what... Uh, political scientists would call a, a continuous variable, not a dichotomous one. That is, mm. there are various degrees, and even the most powerful is not all powerful. Mm -hmm. The United States, for example, now has to deal with the fact that Iraq has a accumulated debt of something like $300 billion. Uh -huh. This debt needs to be written down, written off, uh, reorganized in a way to make it uh, compatible with the use of Iraqi oil resources for rebuilding the country. Because if you don't do this, uh, all of Iraq's oil resources will be consumed totally for the next 10 years, and none will be available for reconstructing the country, and certainly not for defraying American uh, invasion costs. Mm -hmm. So you cannot unilaterally write down debt. It's mm -hmm. not possible. You need to use the IMF, the World Bank, other institutions. This is a long, complicated process that international law, international institutions, multilateral institutions are going to have to be involved in. We cannot do it ourselves. It's just not technically possible. Um, if I may, uh, we, the, we can't. This is a reality. We have to face This is the thing. We live in a world that's an international world. So we, we did uh, a not a, we were not able, the United States and Britain and Spain is interesting, <laughs> colonial uh, powers oh, that we were associated with in terms of this war. We did essentially uh, launch this war against the opinion of, uh, of the world, even the world governments and so forth, uh, unilaterally. Some people have said, I wonder if you might be able to address this, some people have said within the, the rules of understanding that make up the legal structure of the planet and so forth, that the war was illegal that was uh, fought and uh, advanced by the United States in terms of only the Security Council can uh, authorize that. What is your feeling on that? Was it a legal, illegal war? And what is the, if, if people want to bring up the question of the legality of it, what do we say in terms of the unilateral action the United States essentially took? Um, well, I don't accept that. You do you, not? Okay. I don't accept that view because uh, the United Nations has approved of three military actions in its history, mm -hmm. Korea, 52, uh, Iraq in 91, and uh, Afghanistan in 01. Mm -hmm. Every other military action in, his, in this whole period, in the mm -hmm. post-war period, occurred outside the UN framework. Mm -hmm. So it, it can't be correct. Is there such a thing as an illegal war? Well, that's another question. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think people would have viewed Hitler as invasion of Poland. You could have said that... Uh, that uh, and there is international law doctrine on this, but I don't actually think that this is such an important line of inquiry. Let me okay. tell you okay. what I think is more important. Um, the United Nations uh, has, uh, in the case um, of uh, of the Iraq uh, 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 of dealing with Iraq, has set forth a series of 
resolutions that it had to disarm. We know this during the 90s. Uh, these rules were never enforced. These rules were <coughs> not enforced uh, because the members of the Security Council weren't willing to give executive power, enforcement power, to any body that would, any agency that could make Iraq comply with these rules. Now, wasn't there a considerable amount of disarmament taking place between ninety one? Early before, but ninety after ninety eight, they stopped, and there yeah, was but no they'd gotten about ninety percent down yeah, the line, or did. something I, like I'm that. And with the sanctions, and I'm we had no fly zones and that sort of thing. Yeah. I'm not disagreeing with that. Yeah. But the point is, but the larger point is the following: the United Nations Security Council functions only when all of its members agree. Mm -hmm. If all of its members don't agree. It doesn't function. Because you have this veto, for one During thing. During most yeah. of the Cold War, the Russians were vetoing all American initiatives. Mm -hmm. We didn't use the Security Council much because it wasn't possible. In the Korean case, the Russians weren't there. They were abstaining or they were absent. So we were able to use it in that case. It was not used. So the Security Council is a body that does not function when all of its members don't agree. Mm -hmm. Therefore, to say that something happened abnormally mm -hmm. in this case mm -hmm. is not correct. Mm -hmm. This okay. is the normal case. Mm -hmm. All of its members didn't agree, and therefore it doesn't function. It could have been we live in a world with no such thing <laughs> as the United well, Nations. We did for a while, and did. some people think, there's some people within the administration who think it would be fine if the United Nations goes the way of the League. Don't no, you that's, that's a terrible idea. You don't think that? Uh, that's a terrible idea. The United Nations has many important functions, above all, uh, communication functions, a place you, uh, you, you meet people, you learn things. It does have many important functions, but it the Security Council or the, is not a world, is not a court of the world or a parliament. Uh -huh. And some people act as if the United States is now the executive power that must act in the world and the legislative power belongs to the Security Council of the United Nations. Mm -hmm. that, that can't be correct because uh -huh. many of the members of the Security Council represent our, our governments that are not elected, are not accountable, mm -hmm. are tyrannical, mm -hmm. and so forth. So I, it doesn't have... Man this is not to say that what we did was correct. Mm -hmm. And I believe, in fact, the debate about the correctness of the war in Iraq should not be cast as a debate between uh, those who think America should act alone and those who think America must do what the Security Council says. The question is, was this the correct thing to do? Uh, the, the question I was asking you is, like, if, if I go out on Manhattan's uh, west side here and take a gun and shoot you dead, there will be people who will come and say, you broke the law. Right. I will be answerable to a court and right. a judge who will sit on a, on a, on a bench Correct. that will be, have the ability to either take my life, perhaps, in some states, or at least put me in jail for 40 years or something, and declare what I have done has been illegal. Correct. And there's a law that can be backed up with a sufficient... We don't have that in the international realm. So it's a... It Wait. is, a, in terms of that kind of context, it hasn't evolved to that point. Perhaps it will... But it hasn't evolved to that it's point. Dubious. That's what I was getting at. Okay, but let me give you a, mm -hmm. a little background on this. This is more theoretical. Mm -hmm. um, the coherence of a legal system mm -hmm. depends on the coherence of the underlying political system. Okay. Therefore, legal systems in a domestic jurisdiction mm -hmm. in the United States tend to be fairly coherent because the underlying political system is coherent. Mm -hmm. The international community is mm -hmm. not a coherent political community. That's what I was saying earlier. And therefore, its legal system mm -hmm. is very iffy, uh, unreliable, mm. uh, it's full of unenforced uh, declaratory uh, law. A middle case mm -hmm. is the European Union okay. law, yeah. which has been developing as more and more of a coherent legal system mm -hmm. as the European Union becomes more and more coherent politically. we got a euro now that a lot of things are well, being denominated. Economy, in. But yeah. the, to the extent, and mm. a good example mm. to, uh, uh, to, to uh, explain the, the, the general point that I was making is mm -hmm. Nuremberg. Uh -huh. After World War II, the main powers in the world, that mm -hmm. is the international community that was active, mm -hmm. Britain, the United States, and Russia, mm -hmm. were totally agreed. They'd gone through a war effort mm -hmm. against Hitler. Mm -hmm. They had a coherent view, more or less, of what to do. They had to uh, keep on... Uh, uh, tr they wanted to try the uh, the lead Nazi war criminals mm -hmm. and so forth. Mm -hmm. And Nuremberg, the Nuremberg precedent, which mm -hmm. is basically one of the... is the great uh, model yeah, of what international criminal law is, is mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. functioned for a few years, mm -hmm. about three years, two or three years. No sooner was the ink dry on the Nuremberg verdicts mm -hmm. than the international community started to break up. Mm -hmm. The Cold War began. Mm -hmm. The Russians and the Americans no longer cooperated. Mm -hmm. That was the end of international criminal yeah. law. So the reality changed. Because 
law, international criminal law only functions if the international political community is coherent. Yeah, That's coherent. Yeah, I see it like that. In that case, and it, it usually has been throughout history. It's it, we say there's a term that the victors write the history, the victors write the law, and the people, uh, the victor never is in the dock. Uh, certainly on an international scale, right. uh, have not been. Now in domestic court, uh, we, at least we hold to the idea that no one's above the law. But in the case of international relations, victors are above the law, and if they can get away with it, uh, there's no way to bring them to you the can bar. Have Do you understand what I'm saying? I, and is it I evolving do. to where the victors as well, uh, under principles of law, certain universally agreed to principles, let's say by humanity, if we reach uh -huh. out to that sort of thing, or we merge to that kind of a point, where there will be a, bit, a body of law where everyone and no one will be a law, above the law, even the powerful who get away with doing something that is morally re uh, reprehensible? Well, that's not true domestically, okay. that people who are powerful are subordinated to the law to the same degree. Not as to the people. same degree, but they are. If I'm picked up by a police dragnet mm -hmm. by accident, I can mm -hmm. get out in five seconds mm -hmm. by making a single phone call. You've got a good lawyer. But there are... And money. I don't have money. I just have the right phone number. Okay, right. Okay. Uh, but people who don't have the right network can mm -hmm. be caught up in a dragnet system and stay in jail. Well, that's because of the society... Mm -hmm. uh, is unjust. Is really? unjust. Yeah. And uh -huh. those who belong to well-organized groups mm -hmm. have a much better time, much better chance to use the law to their advantage. They're better connected. They're better connected. Yeah. Do you see the thing in the south the other day down Mississippi? They had a county down there that's going to, uh, uh, they said, we're too poor to defend the poor. Yeah, so, they, <laughs> so they said, I took that as a model for our time. We're too poor to defend the poor. You know, Very And, and that's, a, that's a metaphor, perhaps, for the world's society. Well, the world because we have a just. world that is not just or does not have a social coherence Look, in a certain you can ask yourself historically, mm -hmm. whose rights were protected first, mm -hmm. great landowners mm -hmm. or orphans? <laughs> yes. Okay, so the answer is obvious, and the answer means that um, rights are not distributed equally. Mm -hmm. They're distributed to those who have capacities, strengths, wealth, contacts, and so forth. So this is true. Now, it doesn't mean there's no difference between one society and another, yeah. because a good society, if you want to talk about rule of law, yeah. a good society are, is a relatively good society, is one in which many people have a capacity to use legal instruments to protect their interests. Mm. Let me just give you an example. In a, a very bad, tyrannical society, mm -hmm. they also have law, but mm -hmm. law is a stick with which the powerful beat the weak. The law is an ass. Okay. It has been said, yeah. Okay. Can so, be in those cases. And, yeah. and they people make laws, including uh, there were laws governing the recapture of runaway slaves. Absolutely. So that's a law. Yeah. But it's a law serving the interest of the small group of powerful. Ha hasn't law mostly been that throughout human law history? Is, First law and foremost, is, to protect the powerful? Law is still a tool to protect the powerful. Okay. However, there are some societies in which there are more people who are powerful. Mm -hmm. And a good society, and what we mean by the rule of law, mm -hmm. is when, let's say, 60... We being the United States, the United States or the Europe... Yeah. Say the United mm -hmm. States and Western Europe. Mm -hmm. 60, maybe 70 percent of the public belongs to groups that allow them, to, some of the time, to use legal instruments to protect their interests. Mm -hmm. That is, women as well, uh, wives as well as husbands, debtors as well as creditors, tenants as well as landlords, consumers as well as producers, and so forth, and suspects as well as the police, mm -hmm. can use... If a suspect can use a legal instrument to prove that the police planted evidence, for example, mm -hmm. that's a case of a law being of use to a relatively weak person mm -hmm. against uh, another individual who's situated better. Mm -hmm. So what we call rule of law, mm -hmm. which is not the same as rule by law, mm -hmm. not rule as a stick, right. yeah. is a, a system in which a majority or large majority, even up to 70 percent, I, I don't know, it's hard to calculate this, yeah. can use legal instruments to protect themselves some of the time. Mm -hmm. Even in that system, some people fall out mm -hmm. of the protection, yeah. have no capacity to use the law mm -hmm. to protect themselves, mm -hmm. which is horrible, mm -hmm. and some people get a lot more out of the law, that is the very wealthy, for mm -hmm. example, use the right to attorney mm -hmm. uh, very well because they can hire the most brilliant attorney that money can buy. Mm -hmm. But still, if the system distributes some capacities to those who are not terribly well to do mm -hmm. it's a better system and there can be a, there can be a trending in these things and it can, can be, they toward greater equity it can be a trend is what we would hope right there's a trending but i don't i wouldn't want to be um, optimistic i would say we can observe at times 
the, uh, the scope of the rule of law expands and at times contracts. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we uh, extend legal protections mm -hmm. to hitherto for uh, underprivileged groups, mm -hmm. and sometimes we take them away mm -hmm. from these groups. Mm -hmm. And that's a historical pattern. We can try to explain it. Yeah. We can try to influence it. Mm -hmm. and, a, and a legal reformer, mm -hmm. legal reform and legal progressive legal reform yes. is an attempt to try to extend uh, legal protections to groups that had not benefited from them before. Mm -hmm. As historical circumstances change, yes. many of these uh, liberties, rights, are taken away mm -hmm. by, for example, an attorney general mm -hmm. who feels justified by his self-righteous uh, or his, his, uh, his belief in his own infallibility mm -hmm. uh, uh, to act in a way that would normally not be permitted. Under. Many people see that happening now. We had the Patriot Act and these kind of things under a condition where people are frightened, scared, is security, they will flock to authority, and that's going on now. It's Many a very, people see a very it. important point you're making. It surely is. That, uh, oh. If the public, and the public is not innocent here, mm -hmm. if the public views the Bill of Rights as a Trojan horse mm -hmm. for terrorists, it is probably going to allow the Attorney General to uh, abrade, take away, weaken mm -hmm. rights that we have previously thought of as uh, fairly solid uh -huh. and put people in jail, even American citizens. You arrest them, you put them in an army brig, you don't give them any access to an attorney, mm -hmm. and you say, well, I'm not violating the rule against secret trials because mm -hmm. I'm not giving him a trial at all. Yeah, right. That's a really interesting <laughs> use of the language. Isn't it? Well, I can remember back in the old days, it used to be the commies. The commies were the ones yeah. that we were after, and we had the Smith Act. We had the uh, in, uh, you know, a threat to internal security. I think it's still on the books and so forth, but that there are certain groups that we are able to identify as being the enemy within the gate, and we are going to take steps to do that COINTELPRO, that uh, targeted certain yep. people and so forth, a lot of shenanigans by the FBI and other kinds of things, violating uh, constitutional rights, that sort of thing, happened in times when people are frightened. We were frightened of it uh, uh, in the 50s, for instance, and, and so forth. And people are fear fearful. They're silent. And another example of this uh, touches our checks and balances system, because if you uh, deliver uh, envelopes full of anthrax to the Supreme Court, Congress, uh, and the uh, uh, anchor men of the main TV stations, all of a sudden the checks and balance system doesn't work well because these groups who would normally monitor the FBI mm -hmm. feel like their life is threatened mm -hmm. and only the FBI can protect them. Mm -hmm. So they're ready to allow the FBI to walk all over them. Yeah, it happens. Yeah, it, does, so, it has happened in history before, yeah. So and fear is I mean, terrible. And even Hitler was voted in, wasn't he? I think he was well, voted in in 33 or something like that. He and was, so yeah. forth. And uh, so you, you, these things can be done. And the law can be mutable and it can, it can change and so forth. Uh, it extending, overall, uh, historically, it's getting better. It used to be women couldn't vote. Used to be slaves or three fifths of a human being. You know, history through time. James Joyce says history is a nightmare from which we're attempting to awaken, and it maybe it's getting better through time. Do you think? Would you say if you have a, a progressive notion, and it, does that have something to do with the technological, uh, economic advancement of society that is making it possible for greater numbers of people to have a uh, even uh, break in terms of the way the society is set up as we get materially greater capability to produce goods and services and things like that. I don't want to. I don't want to underestimate. Uh, and then uh, one last thing is that, that nationally and internationally mm -hmm. and on a, on a global scale, um, Joe Stiglitz and other people at uh, Columbia now will say that with our Brenton Woods institutions and so forth and the globalization that's taking place. The plutocratic class that is in every society, the people who own assets mm. by and large and so forth, they are everywhere, that they have been doing very, very well growing. They have eight-star hotels to have their meetings in now and so forth. But the masses of the people are not falling behind. Twenty to sixty percent of the people are falling behind in terms of the institutions that are in place. So that we have this problem that's longer running on a world – this, this metaphor extends out on a world scale as well. Well, I definitely believe – that Stiglitz is right on this. I, at least I sympathize with his uh, way of uh, formulating it. Uh, it is true that there, there's progress that's visible. You know, in 1950, a black cab driver could not. It was illegal for him to pick up a white passenger at Union Station in Washington. Mm -hmm. so this is a, really? A, oh, yeah. Good. This is an yeah, unbelievable yeah, yeah. Uh, past yeah, that we have yeah. in this way. So yeah. there are things uh, that are have been <laughs> are uh, better than they were. Nonetheless, I don't think technology cuts only 
in a progressive direction, as mm -hmm. you suggested. Mm -hmm. Because one of the main reasons for uh, a politics that is more redistributive or mm -hmm. uh, based on an idea of redistributive justice is the need of the rich for the poor. For example, when uh, the, land, uh, the property classes need uh, soldiers who are well-fed and literate, mm -hmm. they're much more willing to invest in the education mm -hmm. and the safety net of masses of citizens, yeah, just like you know, yeah. the the, mm. the the classic mm. case of redistribution is in healthcare, where in the 19th century, and say in New York City in the mid 19th century, you could be very rich and buy uh, the best doctor available, but you could not protect yourself from contagious diseases right, right, originating right. in poor neighborhoods. Yeah. So they invested; the wealthy invested in mm. sanitation, health programs, self-interest, if nothing else. Of sure. course, mm. it's a redistribution based on a uh, desire to protect yourself, mm. but it had the effect of creating also a social contract in the sense that even the poor felt included in some way in the benefits of the society. That could apply now in the world. We look well, at you security would, interests. You would it like could be. Well, you, you want to get to your society of law and security. Okay. Too. Yeah, yeah. We can talk about that. Yeah. And I definitely believe you're correct. Mm -hmm. and, if a, and I feel like this dimension um, is, has been neglected. Uh, my, one of my uh, intellectual heroes is uh, Machiavelli. Mm. And Machiavelli oh boy. makes the, <laughs> the prince. Yeah. Well, the, mm. not the Machiavelli you know about. Mm. It's oh, okay. the Machiavelli who makes the following claim, yeah. which is perhaps his most important idea. Mm -hmm. And that is the, the main uh, myopia, short-sightedness mm -hmm. of uh, elites, the rich and the powerful through yeah. history, is the belief that they can survive fine without any interest in the well-being of ordinary people. Right. That is, they don't have to care about how ordinary people live. And this, says Machiavelli, mm -hmm. is a mistake, mm -hmm. and that's why revolutions occur mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the wealthy uh, are overthrown and massacred mm -hmm. at, in, in periodically mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. uprisings. Mm -hmm. Now, and in fact, his whole thinking about constitutionalism and so on was to create a system where the wealthy was forced to remit the wealthy people were forced to remember their dependency on ordinary people mm -hmm. and therefore make investments mm -hmm. in the well-being uh, of ordinary people. And this is, of course, a form of... And he said, this, my prince, is in your interest. Huh? He would say yeah. that the greatest danger... Well, what is the danger that a prince faces? The mm. greatest danger is that if he's tyrannical, he's going to get his throat slit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and therefore, he says, it is uh, better... It is better... Uh, uh, maybe at some time to be feared than to be loved, but worst of all, to be hated. Mm -hmm. Do not be hated. Mm -hmm. This is advice to the United States in the world today. Exactly. Because yeah. what happened on 9-11 was a form of tyrannicide. From mm -hmm. their point of view, from mm -hmm. the people who did this terrible mm -hmm. action, mm -hmm. they viewed the United States mm -hmm. as acting tyrannically in their local context. Mm -hmm. That is, as acting brutally, as being uninterested in the well-being of others. I think there are going to be great more numbers of people around the world who are going to see us that way after Iraq, don't you? Well, here we go. Uh, I'd like to talk about Iraq if we could a little bit because it's a, it's such, it's been on our mind. And I'll say it's been we're on right my the, mind a lot. We're anyway. right in the middle of it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, we're taping on the 17th of April, yeah. Yes, 17th of April. Things are sort of calming down and I think most disturbing um, we're living in it. It's a confusing moment. We don't. There's a, there's a lot of uh, fog surrounding events. We don't quite know where we're going. It's very difficult. You you can't extrapolate from the events of two or three days uh, to understand where we're headed in mm -hmm. the next months, for mm -hmm. example. So we don't quite have enough information. But I think what we can say is that the project to destroy Saddam Hussein's regime, the project to discover weapons of mass destruction are two things at least we can understand what it would be like to do that we sort of have that an idea of that also humanitarian aid we can kind of grasp we know what it involves getting water uh, health care rebuilding the hospitals introducing medicine it's technical maybe very difficult under these conditions of insecurity but we know what it is but the fourth project the largest most difficult future project, which is creating a decent regime in Iraq, not even speaking of democracy, creating a decent regime is very, very difficult. It's going to be difficult. The thing that brought home to me how difficult it's going to be is that picture I mentioned the other night in the New York Times of the 
Kurdish man who was severely wounded and eventually died on a gurney, mm -hmm. being brought into the emergency room of a hospital in the north, and these two spitting. Arab mm. doctors leaning over him, spitting on him. That's the degree of the enmity between the groups that are there. There is mm -hmm. uh, incredible uh, uh, distrust mm -hmm. and hatred, mm -hmm. um, and it's very difficult to create a stable whole out of unstable parts. Yeah, that's right. It's uh, you've got. Um, and, and the, in fact, the very vulnerability of Iraqi society, why it was so easy to plow into it mm -hmm. and overcome it without mm -hmm. resistance is because it doesn't have much coherence. Mm -hmm. And that lack of coherence is exactly what's going to make creating a decent government difficult. Do you think Iraq is particularly unique in that as we look at 191 nations around the world? How many of them form a uh, meaningful ethnic polity and so forth? And how many were just uh, lines of colonial convenience <laughs> on the map drawn? Well, a lot Seas of them. Or, or certainly, whatever. certainly the, the Middle Eastern countries. I mean, you wouldn't want to say, I mean, the Latin American countries weren't drawn that way. But if we focus just on Arab Middle Eastern countries, there is a pattern which is exactly what makes the countries vulnerable. That is that they have a ethnically homogeneous or a mono-ethnic government mm -hmm. and a multi-ethnic society. Mm -hmm. And the mono-ethnic government has the control of the security apparatus, mm -hmm. the police system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I assume, our Defense Department has long been thinking, these are brittle societies. Mm -hmm. And if we pluck out the security apparatus, which mm -hmm. is run in this case by the Tikriti mm -hmm. uh, mob or mm -hmm. of, uh, kinship structure, the North the Sunni, mob, the Sunni, mm. uh, twenty percent mm. uh, is the larger uh, group, but it's a it's a particular uh, 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 group within that that has been running the country. If you pluck that out, mm -hmm. what will happen? Well, the answer is the country will fall into pieces. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, is it possible to put them together? Uh, what do we need to do? Is it a spontaneous process? Mm -hmm. When you listen to Donald Rumsfeld and others. Uh, Wolfowitz, Paul Wolfowitz, they speak as if political order was a spontaneous uh, uh, emergence. Mm -hmm. sp it's sp uh, that political order spontaneously arises from society. Build a Congress, they will come. Yes. This sort of thing. Well, this mm -hmm. is Build a Congress hall, they will come. This is yeah. not very plausible. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that it's impossible. And I find most painful when supporters of the administration say that anyone who has doubts or worries about the possibility of creating Iraqi democracy must be a racist. Mm -hmm. This has nothing to do with genes. Mm -hmm. This is about history, mm -hmm. culture, mm -hmm. you know, a, 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 a process through which the Iraqis have lived in terrible conditions, and it breaks your heart when you learn about the lives of Iraqis yeah, under the, Saddam Hussein. The frenetic tone of things are getting even worse than that. Anybody who raises any doubt about what it is they're doing are almost bordering upon uh, traitorous. Yeah. Terror there they may be terrorists. There is this. They, yeah. And it's getting, particularly now as they start thinking about Iraq, Libya, they're going to, I mean, uh, Syria, sure. Iran, Libya, and other yeah. kinds of things that they expand. They get, they've tasted blood. And they are, they are they're very, very uh, helpful, chortling over their supposed victory there in Iraq and so forth. And there, it, it, it's an expansive thing on our part, do you think? You mean are we going to go elsewhere? Yeah. Um, I'll get to that in a second. I want to just underline your oh, point. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I want to underline your point that mm -hmm. uh, even Bernard, the great Bernard Lewis, professor at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, mm -hmm. wrote in the op-ed page of the Wall Street Journal that people criticizing this adventure really are contributing to the killing of American soldiers. Yeah, right, right. That's how bad yeah. Yeah. this mm -hmm. discourse is, how mm -hmm. primitive yeah. and vulgar mm -hmm. uh, uh, it, uh, the, the, the depths to which it's descended. Now, uh, what exactly, the question of where we're going to go next and will we uh, consider using military force elsewhere is an important one. When Tommy Franks said, uh, about Saddam Hussein, I have his DNA mm -hmm. uh, uh, conveying the thought that even to, to leaders around the world, and Bush himself said this, to leaders around the world, even if we have nothing left of you but a little piece of your tissue in yeah. a dish, we'll know it's you, we'll know it's you we, unlike we Hitler. You, yeah. no, unlike Hitler, yeah. we couldn't identify That's for right. a decade. Science hadn't been advanced that far. So we yeah. can come and get you. You cannot hide. We mm. can enter your country. Yeah. We can slice through your population. We can find you personally, yeah. and we can kill you. And wasn't it amazing how many Americans thought that Saddam Hussein was the one who put the airlines into the buildings <laughs> downtown? 
Well, and there's a... There's you know, it was amazing. The that numbers are 40% or whatever it you is. Know, because, because there's this existential fear floating in the air and so forth. And you find a target for it, that's classic kind of uh, ability to begin to utilize the public to gain some sort of political here power is, over them. Here the it? universities and educational institutions and maybe even cable TV mm -hmm. uh, deserve some blame because mm -hmm. American support, public opinion support for the war in Iraq or the belief that the war in Iraq is a response to 9-11 mm -hmm. derives from the fact that 9-11 was viewed by most Americans as an attack from nowhere, mm -hmm. thereby justifying a counterattack anywhere. everywhere. Yeah. Now, the reason anywhere, it was perceived yeah. as an attack from nowhere mm -hmm. is because most Americans, thanks to our school system, our television networks, know nothing about the rest of the world. We mm -hmm. are a parochial superpower. Mm -hmm. It is a incredible, in my opinion, mm -hmm. national security threat mm -hmm. that we no, no geography, mm -hmm. uh, your field. We don't. Uh, we have very little capacity to see ourselves through the eyes of others. We have become an autistic nation. The images we see mm -hmm. about this war, uh, mm -hmm. among other things, are totally different than the images anyone else is seeing in the world. Correct. And the consequence of that is disconnection. Mm -hmm. We are having no reality checks. Mm -hmm. We are living in a bubble of our own production. One of which is, I mean, one of the things that's very interesting, because I remember back to Vietnam and so forth, is that they did this, this action, proposed this, and then there jumped up people all over the world so quickly in such huge numbers that we were really fighting this war. The New York you know, Times famously said, we, excuse me, we have two superpowers, the United States waging the war yeah. and world public opinion. D to a degree, there is a reaction to this that might be the big story coming out of all this, that there's a reaction against the overreaching uh, activities of the hyperpower of the United States of America. And that may be the overall story uh, in, the, in the longer writing of history, perhaps. I think what they are calculating... Or the status quo uh, notions of the accepting of the status quo if Mr. Stiglitz is right, IMF, International Monetary Fund, our economic theorizing, our political theorizing and so forth, globalization along the patterns that we were going, is leading to a situation which is serving only the plutocratic class of the world. And if we have an administration that's going to give a tax cut, most of which is going to go to the wealthy, the idea that we're going to take care of the wealthy, we started in the idea of law rather than some sort of equity being expanded out to the body politic of the whole six yeah. billion. And if that is the case in the system that we have and what we're going to impose on the world is one that is not going to bring the participation of all the people, then you might have a massive kind of jumping up of the people around the be. world against the established okay. system. And that may be the big story uh, that might be worked out in terms of the intellectual basis by which we would have a system that would make uh, a, a world that would serve the interests of everyone rather than just only the... Uh, the, the target is special interest of the rich and wealthy members of the society. That may be too idealistic, but uh, perhaps... It may be too idealistic, idealistic if um, the rage mm -hmm. against the United States remains an impotent rage. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that must be what uh, the calculation... What, uh, that must be the calculation of those who believe that uh, a society in which the very wealthy live in gated communities mm -hmm. while, the Increasingly. Poor, while the poor can be placed behind prison bars or at least the disruptive, dangerous members of the, the class of the poor. So you have two walls mm -hmm. uh, that make us safe rather than a program of making uh, most citizens feel like they're stakeholders in the system. Yeah, which is not in the cards at the moment. Doesn't look like it, does mm. it? And Neither nationally, if I may. Nor, nor New York City, we've got all kinds of problems. Mr. Every state and municipality and state uh, agency is under tremendous stress now. New York City, they're all in deficit. We have deficits as far as we can see. We're building a permanent wartime economy if we're going to go from country to country. And we have this at, at, at jurisdictional levels all over the world so that it's not a particularly sanguine kind of situation. Can I, can I mention something sure. that's been on my mind? About and let's not forget about your center of law okay. and security, okay? We won't, or perhaps okay. not. But we're just but down to our last ten minutes, brother. So municipalities. I want yeah. to say something about that because you noticed that the Bush administration has pushed a, um, a lifting of taxes on dividends. Mm -hmm. Now, they probably aren't going to get that, but you have to realize what that would imply for cities because if you lift the taxes on dividends, money would rush from municipal bonds mm -hmm. into stocks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And even a 1% increase in the cost of credit to cities would be devastating. Yeah, right. Devastating. Right. So right. these, we've got an administration that is viciously anti-urban, anti-municipal. Anti-folks. 
and uh, anti-folks. I think the consequences. And that's a model for the world that, that writ large. And, and you, mentioned St you mentioned Stiglitz before. And so there may be a massive uprising by people who are going to insist, and then the intellectuals are going to have to yeah. finally come up with some sort of a system that is, in fact, in touch with what the future is uh, offering and requiring if we're going to, as Bucky Fuller used to say, make it rather than unleash these weapons of destruction that can destroy us all. We're at an existential moment in the evolution of all of human affairs and consciousness in this part of the universe, and we're not measuring up. The intellectual community is not measuring up with coming up with a system that can work. Okay, I, Perhaps. Would, I would like to respond to that and give you, since you're being a global philosopher, I'd like to try, <laughs> try my hand at that too, but I want to say a word about uh, Stiglitz and this ta another word about the tax business, because Stiglitz has pointed out, and I think it's a very plausible argument, that Clinton's tax increase mm -hmm. stimulated the economy because mm -hmm. once it became clear to the business community that uh, the deficit was going to be reduced, mm -hmm. they b understood that interest rates would go down, mm -hmm. that credit would become cheaper, uh -huh. that people would have more money to spend, mm -hmm. and they were therefore willing to invest. That's right. We built surplus, what were we, five trillion Perfect. projected surplus or something, all that's if, gone? If you cut taxes, mm -hmm. Bush says, cut mm -hmm. taxes, people will invest. Mm -hmm. That is a form of short-circuiting your logic. Mm -hmm. If you cut taxes, the business community realizes the deficit is going to grow. Mm -hmm. When the deficit grows, the government must borrow money. Mm -hmm. That means interest, interest rates, rates grow up, mm -hmm. credit is more expensive, mm -hmm. nobody's going to buy your products, mm -hmm. and you don't invest. Nobody's going to have the money to buy. You need so, demand. Yeah. So the idea that cutting taxes produces investment is, at the very least, Highly questioned. Could be learning to leading to a deflationary worldwide depression that what we it, had like in yeah. the 1930s. No right? economist thinks this is useful. But what it does is transfer money from the poor to the rich, which mm. is, I suppose, and it's a metaphor works. for the world of where this superpower thinks this world should go. Okay, now for ten star hotels. Now for our, my gl the global mm. point. We've only got about eight minutes left. So. You think I can do it in you, eight minutes? You, you got to <laughs> get it in in eight minutes, young man. You got to get it in. Okay, so one thought. Mm. Uh, and this is a speculation uh, about what is the backup plan of the administration mm -hmm. in Iraq if democracy is not successful. Mm -hmm. Democracy and even a decent, coherent government seems yeah. difficult. And one possibility, and I offer this as a suggestion, it seems to make sense of some of their behavior, is that they would be satisfied with an Afghanistan kind of anarchy. After World War II, the United States protected its security interests by stationing troops in you know, Japan, Germany, eventually South Korea, because it faced off with a world enemy, the communist system, both mm -hmm. the Chinese and the <laughs> Russian. Today, our enemy is not a arm, are not armed states or empires. No. It is a uh, terrorist organization. Stateless. You know. Stateless actors. And therefore, we do not need to station large bodies of troops in countries and therefore, we are not, we don't have a self-interest in creating necessarily coherent polities, even coherent polities with a quizzling like mm. pro-American, hand-picked pro-American government. Mm. In our interest, all we need to protect our interest is to have a state that we can go into and out of anytime we want, mm -hmm. to kill whoever we want mm -hmm. on the basis of secret evidence that has never been double-checked no. and never been looked into. And never by seen us. by the press. Never seen by the press. Never see the light of day. And in fact, one of the wonderful things about the message, we can kill you, your government, we can kill you even on the basis of forged documents, yes, right. even on the basis right. of false evidence. Yeah. So there's nothing that will protect you. Isn't the legal community uh -uh. getting up in arms and the academic community getting up in arms that we're so far along down this path now? Well, well why isn't there more objection? Come on. What, you're, being you're, manifest. We, we, have, we have arrived at our early, earlier on in our conversation, mm. we, we, we came to the point of realizing that law serves the powerful. Well, oh, 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 so, okay, but you know, in the press, if I may, who was it? Was it Menke? I'm not sure who it was, but uh, that in the press, uh, that uh, journalism, it should, it, it should, um, it should um, afflict the powerful, and give power to the po and, and do the opposite Good. for the powerless. You know, yeah. uh, except except 9/11 occurred in the city of world and certainly American journalism. And mm -hmm. one of the reasons that journalists and uh, particularly news broadcasters have been so docile uh, and so obsequious toward the administration is mm -hmm. that they felt personally threatened by 9/11. They realize New York City, which is a place they love, mm -hmm. uh, is in danger. 
Personally threatened and also answerable to the plutocrats who own the stock of the corporations awesome. of which they're a part, and it, that does filter down by having a process where those self-selected people are ones who are going to say what it is. You're more cynical than I am. I think well, I'm not sure <laughs> if I am or not, but I think money That's talks. Good. It's you true. Know? Mm -hmm. I, I, there's something to that. Mm -hmm. But I, even those who are not simply mercenary or venal have uh, were, were, were frightened mm -hmm. by 9-11 uh, and therefore uh, tend not to ask the hard questions. Mm -hmm. But, okay, so one idea is that the United States would be satisfied with managed anarchy, mm -hmm. that they're not going to be too disturbed if nation-building fails in Iraq. Mm -hmm. Uh, they will be able to build fortress, they will be able to build zones of stability, say, around the oil wells, mm -hmm. perhaps around Baghdad or in mm -hmm. part of Baghdad, like Kabul. In Kabul, they can only get part of Kabul. I talked to a guy the other day, he been up there, he says only parts of Kabul yeah. are safe. But is that so dangerous to us? As mm -hmm. long as we can go in and out, mm -hmm. if they try to set up a terrorist training camp, mm -hmm. we can go in and blow it up, mm -hmm. or if we think it is a terrorist. Mm -hmm. If they, if there's, so we can go in and out, the government can't say no. Oh. In a way, Creating a democracy might even be difficult for us. Look what happened in Turkey. Turkey said no, mm -hmm. and democracies tend to. So it could be that we're moving toward a world system where the uh, uh, central power, your hyperpower, the United mm -hmm. States, with its uh, incredible military power, yeah. which, by the way, the more technical it becomes and technological it becomes, the more Mr. Rumsfeld gets his drone army, mm -hmm. Uh, the less dependent he will be on public opinion within the United States mm -hmm. because high tech mm -hmm. means that you don't need cooperation and you mm -hmm. don't have to explain to the parents mm -hmm. of the young men who are all, dying. All of these things in, uh, are, are of, the, uh, of the essence right now. And it would seem, I, we're running out of time, but I just want to get a mention in the fact that you have down at NYU yourself, I think, and some of your colleagues have put together looking at these questions, uh, it, the Center for Law and Security, which is looking at these kind of new emerging Absolutely. realities. Absolutely. And I want to get that mentioned because that's uh, looking at these things in a nuanced kind of way that's relevant to the future. That's yeah, emerging. Our idea, and that's important. We've got about a minute left. Okay. Our idea was that during the Cold War, the primary security threat to the United States was the Soviet nuclear arsenal. Mm -hmm. uh, today, the primary security threat to the United States is a terrorism, mm -hmm. and particularly weapons of mass destruction. In the Cold War, the proper place for studying security questions was departments or centers of international relations. Today, the proper place to study security has to be, at least in part, law schools. Mm -hmm. And law schools around the country are trying to develop programs that focus on security mm -hmm. and problems of banking regulation yeah. for terrorist funding, right. nonproliferation treaties, right. uh, and, of course, uh, international policing, which is Great. the main response. And these are some of the things we've been talking about. You do, wish you the luck. On it. You're just getting it going. And, just wish getting it luck. Going. and it may have become a model for others. And may the, ac the academic law community start addressing these b very big issues that are a sign of our time. Sorry we're running out of time, but just, thanks. Thanks. Thank Thanks you very much for coming. Your pleasure. There's perceptions then of uh, Stephen Holmes. He's a law professor at uh, New York University uh, and is also uh, involved with his new system down there, new center down there, the Center for Law and Security. Happy to bring you those perceptions. We invite you to We'll come back again next week. Stephen, thanks a lot for everything and for coming in. I was happy to be here. And until next time. I enjoyed your also your also your. Your comments, which were well, yeah. Well, it was inter it's an interesting time. The right. Chinese have a saying to spare you from living in right. interesting times. That right. these are very interesting, but it's also really challenging. Yeah, it is. And it seems to me there ought to be a more broad-based kind of. There's been too much sabine, supine acceptance of this. It's amazing. People studying it. The time. level. The level. I mean, here within this country, the world seems to be in opposition. You know, but go ahead. Yeah, but even the world, it's been in opposition, but it doesn't. It can't present a coherent alternative. Uh huh. Uh huh. So um, it's a. I, I don't think rage, outrage, disgust translates well, that, automatically into power. That's, right? that's why. That's why I said I don't think it's so much. A, it, it's a. There's something going on when you get to a situation where you have weapons where you can destroy the whole species. So we cross that line around 1970. That's something brand new in 200,000 years of human existence, there's got to be an adverse side to that somewhere. And it seems to me that adverse side, whether that's maybe we can take care of everybody in a way that we could. Remember, we used to get, we gave the women the vote. Or why would we give the women the vote? Or why do we feel, you know, we, you know, they, they do that, that they, we could take care of everybody in a way that, uh, you know, the, the adverse side of that destructive scenario, something. But it's a failure on the part of the intellectual community to come up with a view of the world that's in keeping with what the future uh, offers and right. perhaps...